This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payment from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter the promo code KNOWHOW to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. On today's show, you'll know how to make beer part two. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Palliser. And I am Brian Burnett. And for as many minutes as we need, we're going to be showing you some of the projects that we've been playing with so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Of course, mm -hmm. Brian, we are in the second of two episodes on Brewing, brewing. Beer. Yeah, this is more of a, uh, a knowledge episode. Yes. Because the last brew episode that we did, we learned what it takes, the ingredients, some of the history of beer, and then a couple of kits that we'll be reviewing and taste testing at the end really of the episode. I really kind of like those kits. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're simple, easy to follow. I think one of them only has like six steps. It's just follow the steps and don't mess up. <laughs> uh, no, I do. I, because I then up. six That's weeks later, yeah, you, well, yeah, we would mess up. But uh, you're, you're putting all this time into it, and then six weeks later, you don't, you don't know until you taste that beer if you messed up or not. And you waited six weeks. You know, and again, that's just like brew, uh, like grow how. So brew how is a lot like grow how in that sense. Mm -hmm. of, so you're learning as you go, especially the first time around. You're like, okay, I should do this. I should do this, and then you make a mistake. It, but it doesn't kill it. It still grows, but you're thinking, is it going to affect the way it ends up? Uh. Right. At least with a plant, too, you can look at it and be like, yeah, that plant is not good to yeah. eat. A beer, you could probably smell it, but you're going to have to... At some point, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put your taste buds on the line. That's right. Well, it. that's why we always have just in case. Well, yeah. Have a bottle. Next I, and to I'm having whiskey. Or just, just moonshine. Just moonshine. Straight just moonshine. Straight, right? straight moonshine. So, so you uh, drink it like you go. water, though. I know, right? Cheers. I know. It's wow. Go, go figure. <laughs> Oh. You, is that bathtub, Padre? Uh, it's the gin stuff. <laughs> it's the gin stuff. Wait, is it, is it, does the, you make gin in a bathtub? Yeah, you probably okay, should. Sure, sure. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I was I was gonna do another soda, but I I actually just remembered because I had been off soda for a long time. Right. And I remembered how disgustingly sweet it is. Okay, so now you're on the same path that uh, I've been on I'm for a like, long time. I'm not liking it anymore. Yeah, because once I got type one diabetes, no more sugar. Beer though, beer, beer, beer is okay. <laughs> well, beer's fine. Yeah, I mean, in moderation. No beer. beer is fine. You, I don't know if that's true. A lot of sugar in, uh, <laughs> in soda and, and beer, but but more so in soda. And then once you once you stop drinking soda for a little while, like you realize it's start it's super sweet. And juice is the next thing. If you don't drink juice very often, it's gonna be super sweet. And then you start drinking diet, and then you realize you stop drinking, you don't drink that very often anymore, and you realize that's pretty gross tasting too. And you know, then that, you just go back to beer, water, and whiskey. It's funny because uh, my mother had been trying to get me off of soda for the longest time. She's like, you just drink juice, just drink juice. No, and I was like, mom, worse. that's actually worse. Yeah. Most of those are so sugar added. I mean, there's more sugar in that than in a can of Coke, so. Uh, so that's a beer in moderation and it's a lot healthy. of water. It's healthy, it's a healthy choice. It's <laughs> Yes, it's the healthy It's just choice. water with some stuff added, really. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we talked about it's, that last it's episode. It's just like this. It's just water, with some extra stuff. yeast, hops, barley. Yeah, no big deal. There we go, folks. Mm. Now, okay, last time you showed us a little bit of what it takes to, to brew beer at home mm -hmm. if you buy one of these pre-made boxes. Well, you also had a chit-chat with Russell, who was able to give us sort of a, a more wizened old man's view of what it takes to, <laughs> to do a homebrew. Yes, uh, I would say like the escalated version of, of what we did in the, the little uh, plastic keg. Yeah, yeah. But today you got a little something special planned for us. You, you took a trip to an actual brewery, like a commercial yeah. brewery, and you found some fascinating pieces of technology, some, some equipment mm -hmm. that that you might not think of when you think of a brewery, but it actually looked really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. This is uh, one of my favorite breweries, and I've been going there for, actually I've been going there before I was 21. 
Oh, uh, wait. Maybe you shouldn't say that. <laughs> but I didn't drink beer. Okay, I just okay, went there because I, I liked it. And then after I learned about beer, I started going there more often. And uh, yeah, I had an opportunity to see the behind the scenes, all the equipment they use. It's basically, you know, it's funny because it's like the same thing I did at home, but on a much larger <laughs> gigantic scale. Gigantic scale. And very sophisticated. And they've had time to experiment with different um, ingredients and things like that. So uh, yeah, let's, well, I... I went there, so maybe we should uh, take a look at the video. Now that I've learned how to brew beer on my own and talked to the pro brewer Russell Tammany himself, I decided to take a trip uh, about 30 minutes north to 3rd Street Ale Works in Santa Rosa to find out from the pros just how beer is made at a real brewery. Now, 3rd Street is definitely one of my favorite breweries to go to. They have a long list of new beers always on tap. And fortunately, I know the manager, so I got a behind-the-scenes tour of all the taps, all the equipment they use, and just a quick introduction to what things are like at the brewery. Uh, they always have new beers on tap, and one of my favorites is definitely the Grapefruit Puddle Jumper. And if you do stop in to check out some of the uh, other amenities, there's a lot, not a lot of space in the brewery as far as brewing beer. And that will lead to one of the reasons why I'm actually here in the beginning. But before we get to that, just going through the back of uh, the equipment, there's a lot of vats for brewing beer, uh, some really neat equipment as far as uh, transferring beer and making sure that everything is sanitized. But the process of bottling is kind of a time intensive and space intensive endeavor. And Third Street has kind of come up with a clever way around that. But before we get to that, there is the vat that they use uh, to brew beer, and right now they're sanitizing it and filling it with water, and above where that vat is, they keep all the ingredients, so malt, the hops, the different kinds of roasted uh, grains and things that they use for the beer. And as far as it comes to having hops on hand, it's actually a lot more space conducive to have things in pellet size, compressed down little hot pellets. And that way you reduce on the amount of space that you have to to use for hops without having to compromise uh, the taste. And above one of the vats upstairs where I was shown, uh, drains into the vat with the, the grains from the hopper. And that allows for easy transfer of the ingredients to the vat to make, to brew beer. And along the back of the bar, there are a bunch of kegs and a pretty elaborate uh, hose system that delivers the beer to the taps. And it has to be a specific pressure. So to avoid like over carbonation or under carbonation. And I've always wondered what do they do with all the extra beer? Well, they actually have a storeroom upstairs that keeps all the kegs and things cool. But what happens when you have all this beer, but you want to also sell beer and not just at the brewery? Well, that's where the modular beer dispensing machine comes into play. And it's a pretty neat setup. So if you go onto the back patio of the brewery at 3rd Street, there is this machine that once a month will show up and uh, a very talented engineer sets it up. And there's all this uh, equipment that's used to put together about 4,000 bottles of beer in a day. And so what they do is they take one of the pipes from the vats inside the brewery and pipe it out to this machine and they set up all these boxes with different empty beer bottles and they're just ready to go here but they haven't been labeled. And of course you can't just put beer in an, like an empty bottle, you have to, to label it and by the end of the day those flats will be filled with beer. So what they have is a labeling machine that's pretty nifty where it siphons through the different beer bottles and rotates them and applies these stickers of the label to the beer bottle. And all this happens within a few seconds and it's all pretty slick. As you can see, the bottles here are following through one another into this little rotating spot and then the stickers are then applied to the beer bottle. And as the stickers are applied to the beer bottle, they collect at the end of the little automated 
uh, section here. As they collect at the end, they are then picked up and then put onto a sanitization tray. And what this is, is it holds the bottles upside down and underneath it shoots clean sanitized water into the beer bottles, cleaning the beer bottles and then making them ready for the insertion of beer. And once the bottles are all lined up in this little tray here, these there's these tubes that inject down into the beer bottles, filling them to the exact measurement of beer. And as it fills up one, the following number of beers goes through and then is capped. And on the top side of the machine, there is actually a, uh, a bottle cap dispository that rotates the, the caps from the little uh, catcher up and over magnetically that then is sealed on top of the, the, uh, the bottles. So it's a little assembly line machine that fills the bottles and caps them. And then on the other side, a worker then grabs them and puts them into boxes and loads them onto a wooden flat. And all this takes about less than 20 seconds to, to fill the beers and then move them on to the next row. And like I said, they can do thousands of beer bottling in a day and then have them ready to ship out to stores in the nearby area. And the benefits of having this are that they don't have to have the equipment on site and that they can still sell their beer into uh, st nearby stores and all over the all over the county. So watching this whole process was pretty amazing and I'm really glad that I got a chance to see this because uh, not only do I like beer, but the automization that has happened here allows smaller breweries to dispense their beer efficiently and uh, you know gets beer into the, the mouths of their customers. Okay, my, my favorite part of that is the bottling section. Yeah, right? That's actually kind of cool. The machinery that it takes and the, the fact that they um, they haven't been able to bottle on site, so they just right. have the truck come and do it. It's like a mobile the mobile bottling truck, and, and then they're able to ship all that out, and they, it's like cut down on costs, and they don't have to worry about the space and everything. So yeah, it was pretty cool watching the bottles go through. And, you know, it, and it, it made sense to me because, I mean, if you've got a brewery, the last thing you want to do is have a dedicated part of that brewery that isn't used 90% of the time. Right, so just right. have it back up, take all of the, the resources, all of the store that you've created, and then just run it through that little mobile truck. Exactly. Uh, by the way, I want to make one of those mobile trucks. <laughs> yeah, you could, you know, you could talk to the guy. I'm sure he'd be willing to help you make one of your own. <laughs> You'll know how to make yeah. a mobile bottling truck. Yeah. Uh, uh, how many bottles do they push out in, in like a bottling session? Oh, you know what? I don't think I ever remembered to ask him that. I'll find out. They, so they just wait until like all their vats are full, or is yeah, this, they is... wait till their vats okay. are full, and then he'll come once a month. And then uh... once he comes, they uh, they have the special orders that they fill to all. The different markets in the area so like Petaluma Market all this like everywhere in the Sonoma County area um, but they must I mean they must be like a thousand bottles wow. in a day yeah that's very cool mm -hmm. that's very cool all right folks well that was your view of uh, well the inner workings of a brewery but you know how Brian sat down with Russell to have a heart-to-heart -heart with a home brewer Brian also sat down with a real brewer in a mm -hmm. real commercial brewery to give you all the knowledge you need to move from small scale to super, super large scale. But before we go there, you know what I want to do, Brian? What's that? I want to thank a sponsor of KnowHow. Oh, yeah, me too then. Now, now, now you may not remember this because you're, you're like four years old. I mean, you're, you're young. <laughs> just a you're baby. Young. That's you're, what you're the just beard a baby. came you got the in. baby yeah. face thing going on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, back in the day when you wanted to create a financial transaction server, it was, it was pretty complicated. Right. Well, and you might not just be trying to make a, a financial uh, site, but you're trying to do a, your own site yep. where you want to sell something, but you also have to do all that back-end stuff to get it Precisely. all the Precisely. You had to make sure you had a, a secure server, you had to hire space for it, you had to get the bandwidth, you had to get a financial transaction processor, mm -hmm. and then you probably needed an administrator to make sure everything stays up to date, because the last thing you wanted to do was to lose your customer's financial information. That would right. be the nightmare scenario. But you really just want to be able to focus on your business. Yeah, and that's <laughs> the hard thing, because I mean, you want to focus on the thing that you're building, be it a, a website or a particular product or service, but you can't do that if you're always worrying about the financials. What if I told you there was a way to take all of that trouble, all of that nuisance, all of those steps, and compress it down into one easy integration. Uh, I believe you because Braintree exists. Precisely, it is Braintree. Now Braintree is the easiest way for you to add financial transactions to your app, to your service, to your server. It's, it's just a different way to think 
about how we do financial transactions. Now, my next year, maybe even next week, there could be a whole new way to pay. Maybe it will be the next Bitcoin, or maybe the next Apple Pay, or maybe even both. But fortunately, Braintree's full-stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds. And that means that you can adapt easily, too. You can accept everything from Pounds to PayPal to that next big innovation from any device with just one integration. And when that new payment method does come along, all you have to do is update a few lines of code and you're good to go. What does this mean? Well, it means no more late nights. It means no more complicated recoding. It means no more panic because a financial transaction has gone awry or you might have thought that maybe you were breached and you've lost credit card information. Nope, that all goes away with Braintree. No stress about staying ahead of the curve. Braintree Payments is here to help. Now, it gives you simple, secure payments, code that you can integrate quickly, and the Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. They've got an SDK in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby, and elegant code with clear documentation so you know exactly how it works and exactly how to integrate it. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. You really have no excuse not to try Braintree. You can learn more at BraintreePayments.com slash know-how. That's BraintreePayments.com slash know-how. And we thank Braintree Payments for their support of know-how. All right, Brian, set this up for us. All right. So I wanted to know, like, now that we've kind of gotten into the steps of what's behind brewing, what it takes to your own kit, and then escalate to that, and then the professional, what would it take uh, someone to get into the field and become a professional brewer? What what is some of the things that you would want to to learn, or some of the thing experiences that a professional brewer has had in in this sort of like it's been a, a crazy growth mm -hmm. of, of breweries in the last uh, decade. So I just wanted to sit down with someone and ask him a few of those questions, and here's the interview. So we found out how to make beer, and then I've come here to Third Street in Santa Rosa with my good friend Carrie, and. We wanted to get a closer look at what it's like to work in a brewery, but also what are some of the challenges in a large-scale uh, brewery like this. And so, Kerry, before we get into the brewery, what was your first intro into uh, getting into this industry? Well, luckily enough for me, I was able to uh, get into it at Moylands in Nevada uh, back in the mid-'90s. Um, I'd always liked craft beer, but uh, Brendan gave me a shot to work for the brewery and became a bartender. And... I've been able to get paid for it for over 20 years. Pretty lucky. That's awesome. And so having now worked here at Third Street, how long have you been here at Third Street? Almost 11 years now, yeah. Okay. So you've probably seen everything there is, the ins and outs as, as far as it goes is beer making. <laughs> uh, earlier we were taking a look at the, um, the bottling system that you have here. And part of it was because... You have limited space here at the brewery. Um, tell me a little bit about how it came to be and why you use that bottling modular system over there. Sure, sure. So uh, although the building does look big from the outside, we are limited on space in here. Uh, we were at a beer fest a few years ago, and one of the local breweries from Novato, or from actually Petaluma, um, I was helping him unload, and he had some 22-ounce bottles, and we got to talking, and he has a mobile bottler that comes down to his spot, and four or five hours later, he's got 300 cases of beer. So... I was able to get a little contact information, pass it on to my owner, and for us it's great because we literally just don't have the space here for a bottling line. So gentleman comes and sets up in our patio, and literally it's amazing. He'll Today he'll be here for three or four hours, and we'll have 360 cases of beer. So it worked out. We have to think out of the box when we have a small space. So it worked out great for us, that's for sure. Yeah, no, that's a really creative uh, way of coming, getting around the limited space. And then you were also telling me that um, – some of the grains and byproducts that you have from the beer is also used in like the food and like the bread and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So we have a local brewery, a uh, local bakery actually that uses our spent grain and puts it uh, back into uh, some uh, sandwich rolls for us, and we get buns made with our spent grain in it. So it's great. Also, the all the spent grain actually goes to a few local farmers around here. So it's awesome. These guys come on our brewing days and they'll come load up and they are glad to take it. They feed it to their cows and to their pigs, and so it's awesome. So we, we recycle. Nothing goes to waste. It's it works out good for us and the local cows. It's great. Oh, that's so cool. I like how it all comes full circle. And uh, I was speaking to two of your, I guess, head brewers, Tyler and Adam. Adam, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you could, obviously when you talk to these guys, they're passionate about beer and everything that they do here. But um, could you tell me a little bit about like what they did and, and maybe to your history too of what you did to get into beer like as far as like a, a home brewer and then going to school and then becoming a real uh, – getting paid – 
paid to pay, to make beer. Yeah, so I can speak to Tyler a little bit for sure. He uh, started out as a home brewer. Um, he went to UC Davis. UC Davis has an amazing uh, beer program, a brewing program, sciences. So it worked out great. Most of the brewers I've ever met have all been home brewers. Very few start out by going to school and then become home brewers, but it happens every once in a while. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's a very intensive class. It's one of the probably the probably two premier schools in the country that do brewing, and right here in our backyard, UC Davis is one of them. A lot of great brewers have gone through that. But yeah, it's definitely a passion for sure. Those guys, I mean. They get paid to talk about beer, and they get paid to make beer, so it's pretty sweet. I mean, most every brewer I've ever met, I think, kind of has that attitude. They're very passionate about what they do. Our assistant brewer, Adam, on the other hand, uh, took a different path. He was a home brewer first. Uh, local, him and local guys got together and entered a lot of home brewing competitions, and we hired Adam here to do a little side work for us and ended up getting a job in the cellar, and uh, we lost our assistant brewer. He actually got promoted to another brewery, and Adam just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and... Now he gets literally gets paid to do what he loves to do. So it's it's pretty awesome. And me too. I I figured out a way for 20 years plus now to get paid to talk about beer. To meet get get to meet great people who love beer and are passionate about beer and I mean we've been here for 20 years now so it's worked out really great. So we talked about the individual bottling system that you have here and that's how you're able to distribute your beer uh, outside of the brewery. But another cool mechanism that you have for beer inside the brewery is something called a crowler, which I had never heard of until I came here. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Sure, sure. So the crowler is uh, the brainchild of our assistant brewer, Adam. He had seen a YouTube video of uh, a company that had this, showed it to me, and we, were, we just were blown away. Uh, basically, you get a 32-ounce can. Um, and you can take it to go just like any other can. So it's great. It's essentially every beer we make with the exception of the nitrogen beer and the cask beer, you can get put into a 32 ounce can, take it to go with you. It takes less than 30 seconds to do. And it's awesome. Our customers have absolutely loved it. Uh, we've been doing about 150 a week since we got it two years ago. So it's been a huge success for us. And frankly, it just gives customers another way to take our beer home. We know we do three different styles in the 22 ounce bottles. And uh, we also have uh, big, cro- uh, big growlers, metal, and and glass and those hold uh, 64 ounces or four pints um, so this is just an awesome way to be able to take uh, to be home with you we even figured out a way to do a three pack so it's it's just it's been great not just for us but our customers absolutely love it it's been awesome it's a uh, it's probably some of the best money we've spent in 20 years we've been here so it's, it's been a huge success for us and uh, we love it we love it Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time today. I know if people want to find more about you, you're at Razor Nipple on Twitter. You've been a big Twit fan for a long time. Uh, but if they want to find out more about Third Street Brewery or what you, what kind of beers you guys have on top, or if they're coming to visit Twit and they happen to make their way up to Santa Rosa, uh, where could they find more information about Third Street? Yeah, so you can always check our website out, thirdstreetoakworks.com. Um, we have a Facebook page and a Twitter page and all that fun stuff. But, yeah, come down to the pub anytime you want. Um, we, you know, we try to always have, you know, 12, 14, 15 beers on tap. So you can find us locally in stores from Safeway to Oliver's to Whole Foods around. So, But the best place to always come is come down to the pub and get it fresh. Well, now that you've seen what it's like to be work at a brewery, come visit and have a beer. You, you know, the, the thing about watching professionals – go to work is it really brings out the fact that there's something different about doing it very small scale and then doing it very large scale and and you know what our area of expertise with our our area of fandom Mm -hmm. that is filled with kickstarters and indiegogos that's something that often escapes people that just because you can make one or a dozen or a hundred doesn't mean you can make (laughs) thousands right right the consistency is definitely a hard part but i think what and it all a lot of it comes down to if you want to do something in an industry you got to be passionate about it and a lot of people who started doing things like brewing you know, they did it at home. They did it like they started with just a kit, and then it escalated from there. They learned more and more, and then eventually, like they went to school. They and now they're working at a giant brewery. They're doing thousands of beers at a time, and then they also get to experiment and do like all these cool little projects on the side too. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting, yeah, especially since I mean, yes, all of the lessons that you had from last week's episode, mm-hmm. uh, you could you could extrapolate that. It's the same process. It's just the magnitude. The magnitude yeah. is much bigger. But but once you start increasing to that kind of magnitude, it's no longer like my little project. It's not. It's now my enterprise. And there right. really is that switchover. Some people feel that it sucks the joy out of it. For me, 
I actually kind of like it. It's a logistical challenge to keep everything going. I mean, when you're when you're running a little one gallon thing at home, it's oh, I got my kit. Now mm -hmm. I got to take care of this thing for the next six weeks. If you're <laughs> running a brewery, you're not worrying about that batch. You're worrying about the batch for the next five years, and you right. have to keep all the trucks coming in with all the raw ingredients. You got to make sure the employees are doing what they're doing. Right. You got to make sure the bottling truck is showing up when it's showing up. <laughs> you have to make sure that all the deliveries are made. So yeah, it's yeah. it is the, still the home brewing kit. It's just. It's, big yeah a, a definitely a, a whole nother magnitude to it um but it, it it's a thing that I, I can appreciate like being able to observe and see and having gone to this brewery for so many years and seen like the different things that they have tried and then how it's grown from mm -hmm. what it used to be it's really it's really exciting and it's good to know the people behind it and stuff too well, well anytime you get to see something grow up you yeah. can feel a special attachment to it definitely yeah, i'm sure that if i grew up in in petaluma i probably would be attached to you know the, my local local brewery it's just where i grew up we didn't have any. They had an invented beer. No, yeah, no. We, in fact, we still have an invented beer. There's no beer over there. We have, we have mead. Yeah, mead. Mead. I'll take a stein Hugs of mead. mead and I'll go over to the Coca-Cola factory. Butter beer or and whatever butter. they had in. Oh, in Harry, Harry Potter? Potter. Actually, I had butter beer or what they call butter beer in this Harry Potter world. Right? Oh, it was gross. Yeah, it, it was, was really like, sweet. It was very sweet. Like, no, no like a soda times ten. I, I had uh, something at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter when I was in Orlando, mm -hmm. and I just remember I took a sip. I'm like, nope. Nope. I don't know what it was. That's probably nope. what it was. Nope. That's probably what it was. It, 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 it literally tasted like melted hard candies. <laughs> like, why why did you give this to me? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah. No, don't drink that. Just stick with beer. Okay. So, okay. so the healthy choice again. Absolutely. Folks, yeah. remember here on Know How, we know <laughs> that beer is the healthy choice. Uh, when we come back, we actually have some of that healthy choice because you wanted to do a proper taste test. And that wasn't mm -hmm. going to include me because all I would be, be doing is cracking wise about your right. beer and complaining. Skills. Yeah. But uh, you got together a couple of the guys, mm -hmm. uh, Russell and Alex, and you made sure that they were ready to taste your concoction. <laughs> yeah, well, we had the two kits, mm -hmm. and we wanted to taste them side by side. But, you know, I wanted a couple of uh, guinea pigs. I mean, impartial <laughs> uh, taste testers to, to try it out. And, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see which one was preferred. We'll get there in just a bit. But first, let's go ahead and take another moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of Know How. Folks... We live in a smart world. We've got smart cars, smart phones, smart devices, smart laptops, smart houses. So why is it that we are still so stupid when it comes to keeping track of all our devices? I mean, I've been, I've been actually very good for the last year or so. I haven't lost anything big ticket, but I used to lose things constantly. It's just too easy with the, an era of really small devices that are very powerful to walk away. Maybe you leave it at a coffee store. Maybe you leave it on a park bench. Maybe it just falls out of your pocket. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a way for you to keep track of all your smart devices with something that was even smarter. Well, folks, that's not just a wish, it's reality. It's called Tracker. A tracker is the easiest way to track all of your devices to make sure that you never lose them. Losing one's possessions can make you feel stupid. This makes you feel start. Now this, this is all it is. It's this tiny little device and it's got a replaceable battery so that you can, rather than buying a new device as you do with some other products, you just replace the battery and you're good to go. Now with this little tracker, you can attach it to your keys, to your bag, to any item, maybe even a pet if you put it in the, uh, the weather resistant case and it allows you to sync up with your device via Bluetooth. Now it's Bluetooth LE, so it lasts for a full year on a battery charge, but not only that, it uses what's called Crowd GPS. It's basically a mesh. Yeah. So if this is synced up to your device, you can get warnings on your mobile phone that you're about to walk away from it. But let's say you walk out of range completely, or let's say it gets stolen. Well, it doesn't have to be within range of your mobile device. As long as you're within 100 feet of any tracker user, you will get a ping on your phone. You will get a notification telling you exactly where it is. That's just cool. Uh, it can help you locate your misplaced keys. It can help you find up to 10 devices that are paired to your, device, to your, uh, to your mobile device at once. And again, because it is Bluetooth linked, it, there's a two-way separation alert. If you lose your phone, you can just find one of your trackers, hit the button, and it will make your phone ring. This is probably the ultimate in finding your smart devices. That crowd GPS network is absolutely fantastic. It is gonna find someone nearby who does use tracker, which means that you could find it even if your device is thousands of miles away. 
Try that with your other Bluetooth-enabled tracking device. Now, here's something that's especially interesting. There's a thing called Tracker Atlas that works with your Tracker Bravo or third-party Bluetooth tracker, which will pinpoint your items not just within a couple of meters or within a couple of feet, but within the a house, within a, an office, to the specific floor where you might be located. I'll simply ask Tracker Atlas where your item is, and you'll get an answer. No need to search. If you're tired of losing your devices, if you're ready to look at a better way to keep track of all your things, well, then you need to get yourself the tracker. We want you to try the tracker. Go to thetracker.com and never lose your possessions again. Whilst just for our audience, if you enter the promo code KNOWHOW, you'll get a free Tracker Bravo with your order. That's the tracker, T H E T R A C K R.com, promo code KNOWHOW to get your free Tracker Bravo today. And we thank the tracker for their support of Know How. Brian. Padre. Judgment Day. That's right. That's right. We had to wait a little while. We had to. Uh you know, be patient, kind of like we've had with our Grow How projects. Mm -hmm. But finally, we got to sit down and try the two different beer kits that we play Six with. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. Six weeks of trying to, to make this thing just about right. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to put any judgment because I didn't taste it because I don't drink beer. <laughs> but uh, without further ado, I think we should go to our panel of drunken experts. So it's come time to taste test the brew that I made in the Mr. Beer kit. Uh, it took 14 days in the fermenter, the little keg, and then bottling, which you have to do the same sanitization process with these plastic bottles, like uh, clean it out, uh, pour the beer in, and make sure to add a, I think it's a teaspoon and a half of sugar so that the yeast has something to eat and then it carbonates and ferments inside the bottle. Um, after you've done that, you wait another 14 days and then in, this is what you've got. Um, hopefully drinkable beer. Yeah. So you willing to taste test this with me, Russell? Sure. I've never had a beer that tried to kill me. Yeah, <laughs> I hope not. Have you ever um, fermented in the bottle? Uh, no, I actually haven't yet. Okay, well, we'll find I've, out what uh, happens. I've been interested to do that for maybe like a Belgian or a sour or something like that. that N not necessarily a, a red ale. Uh, it looks like beer. Looks like beer. And it has bubbles in it. I'll pour it's you a, a glass. It's always a good sign when it when it hisses and has bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you go. Uh, well, cheers. Cheers. Yeah, I think yeah. it's okay. Yeah, I don't think it'll like, kill you. It tastes like beer. Yeah, I think it could be a little colder. I should probably should have left it in the fridge for a little bit longer. Yeah, but uh, you know, other than that, it, it still tastes like beer. Yeah, but uh, what you'll notice with some of the, the in-bottle fermenting and stuff is that there'll be a little bit of sediment at the bottom and stuff. So just be careful when you're pouring it out not to go all the way. Yeah, sometimes you don't want to pour the very last bit out or just be a little gentle with the bottle right before you uh, pour them out. Right. So I'm pretty happy with the Mr. Beer Kit. I'll probably use it again. Um, but I think next yeah. time if we do this project, I want to I wanna use your brew setup and see what we can come up with. Yeah, it'd be fun to try to clone a beer or to try to uh, come up with a recipe and then and then run through the whole process. But, you know, it does take basically a full day. Right. It takes a full day, and then you've got to be patient after that and let it all ferment. Yeah. But uh, before we sign off, Alex, why don't you come over here and try some of this beer and see what you think? Because uh, I know you wanted to try some too. Yeah? It's okay? He's walking off with the bottle, so I think he uh I think I think, I think he approves. Yes. Yeah, he's not oh, was oh, he's not oh he's choking off screen. No, 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 he's not. He's he's not poisoned. All right, he survived. Uh, me and Russell survived. We'll probably finish this off uh, in a little bit. But yeah, that was the the complete cycle for the the beer how that we've been doing. Uh, if you want to find more or the kit or things like that, be sure to to check the show notes on the page and um, otherwise, happy brewing. Do it at home. Back to uh, the studio with me and Padre. Okay, so, uh, you know what? I'm going to call that a successful first batch. I'd like to say we, so. We were expecting, you know, there's going to be some hiccups. It's not going to be perfect. It was your first time out of the gate. And also, it was your first time trying to do two kits at the same time. So that's, right. you know, I, kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, Alex put it best, right? <laughs> it wasn't bad. <laughs> you know, I think you got to get that inflection. It, it wasn't bad. bad. <laughs>
Question yeah. mark? Actually, I believe we know here on Know How now that uh, if any time Mr. Gumpel says that wasn't like the worst thing ever, then that's it, a win. You've, actually done, you've done that's well. That's a win. Yeah, congratulations. All right. Man. Brew how success. We, you deserve a ribbon for that. We'll give you the Gumpel <laughs> or maybe another beer. Another beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. You know, we're probably going to have to come back at some point and do another Brew how because um, I actually want to try my hand at it, which means I'm, yeah. I'm going to be doing the sweet stuff. I'm going to try to make some that. Some mead. mead. Yeah. Not, not that stuff at the Wizarding World because that stuff is disgusting. That doesn't count. That doesn't no. count. No. Some, someone gave me a recipe for, uh, what was it called? Like honey's mead? Honey, tiny mead? I think. You know, that might be, the one you're thinking of might be the oldest beer recipe on there record, which I think involved honey. And I think Dogfish Head Brewery made it. I'll have to, I'll research it, but maybe we'll try and re redo the oldest uh, beer. And then man. it'll be something that I really like and that you can't stand. Yeah, if it's sweet, I, like I, I won't like it. And then no. I will make Alex and uh, and Russell taste it. <laughs> right. it's just to get them going like this. <laughs> well, and then mead is uh, properly drank from the skull of your enemies. So, uh, like, well. cheers! <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we know that this was a lot of information, and uh, well, we're going to put it all into our show notes. Do you want to see the kits that he used to make the beer that they tested mm -hmm. today? Do you want to see the actual brewery that he went to? And in fact, uh, you know what you should probably do? You should probably take any of the outtakes from uh, from the interviews <laughs> and, and you know, give it to the folks. Yeah, a little like blooper reel yeah, or we'll something like that. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. And I'll also put a link if you're in the area where to find Third Street Brewery in Santa Rosa. Precisely. And you're going to find all of that stuff at our show notes, which I always forget where they are. Mm, it's funny that you forget because I remember. It's <laughs> twit.tv slash kh. And not only will you find the show notes, but you'll find the prior episodes. And if this is the first brew how that you're watching, you're going to want to go back and watch it's not the, gonna make much first, yeah, the first it's brew how and download that. And if you missed that episode, it's because you didn't subscribe subscribe so do that yes please do and also don't forget that you need to join our google plus group it's the best place to talk to us and to all of our kitas that's our know-it-alls we've got over 10,000 of them in that group from all ranges of the maker spectrum experts who can show you the knowledge that they've accumulated over the years we've got beginners who may be needing your help to start a new project or figure out a problem that they've run into again you're going to find it all at google plus just search for know-how ask to join and i will approve you right away that's right. But if you want to see what beer we're drinking outside of Know How, well, Your none beer. for Padre. No, but <laughs> Bud Light. Which I've been told is not beer. Nah, it doesn't really count. That's good for hydrating, though. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> it is basically just water with some extra stuff, right? I could, like, you can filter Bud Light and get pure water. Right? Yeah. I think exactly. that's how that works. Exactly. Well, you, you know, not to knock it, when I was walking around Europe and it was hot every day and I would go to a brewery, all I wanted was, like, a Pilsner. Something light. So I had a lot of Heinekens in Amsterdam. And, but I think they, and they just looked at you. Me. But did you ask for three? I said, did you say oh three? no. I might have said oh, three. Oh no! And then they knew. That, that's and when they started they speaking knew. English. And they were like, yeah, American. <laughs> kind of sad. American. But you can follow us on Twitter. That's the point I was trying to get yeah. to. Hold on, one more sip. Just, mm, there. Mm. Right, there we go. All right, Twitter. That's where you want to go. I am at cranky underscore hippo, and you're going to find me at padre sj. And you know what? Our director really hates it when we say his his uh, Twitter address. So no, we're not I think he's gotten over it. No, no, yeah. we're not going to do it. I mean, say? he he was in this episode. No, I'll, as, you know, as a guest. All I would say is Alex is a fantastic person, and I'm glad that he's a director. I'm glad he's pushing our buttons. A N E L F three. Ah, sorry. See, at I, if you watch when he moves his hand away from the panel. <laughs> that at go there and uh, and say hi. And by the way, give him birthday blessings because it was a long time ago by the time this episode comes out, but uh, he's old now. He's like 38 he's, he's, or something It's all now. downhill. By it's the time all. this episode airs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Britt. And now that you know how, go brew it. <laughs>